Good evening. Uh, my name is Rick Mars. I'm the Dean of Seaver College, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this fourth uh, W. David Baird Distinguished Lecture Series of this fall. Uh, we've had a wonderful fall uh, series of lectures, and tonight will be no exception. In fact, it may be the highlight of the semester, and that's saying quite a bit, given who we've had come earlier. Um, it's my pleasure to let you know what the format will be tonight, and then to introduce the person who will introduce our speaker. Uh, if you haven't been here before, the format is pretty standard. The difference tonight is I think we'll have a video at uh, an early stage, but um, our speaker will speak for however long she wants to speak, actually. We'll leave that wide open to you. And then afterward, we'll have ample time for question and answer, and she'll field the questions herself. And then at an appropriate time, I'll let her know we've got maybe time for one more question or whatever. If you, I think the acoustics in this room are good. You can see some mics hanging from the ceiling. So if you'll raise your hand, uh, if you stand, we should be able to hear your question and be in pretty good shape. So we, um, we think we'll be just fine on that. Uh, the only other thing I wanna let you know is that if you would like an autographed picture, if you'll leave your name at the back table before you leave, we will make sure you get one. Uh, Tracy will not autograph pictures tonight, so if you're planning on making a fortune on eBay uh, later this evening, it's not going to happen. Uh, but if you would like an autographed copy, uh, feel free. And so, again, we're delighted that uh, you've taken time out of your busy schedule to uh, come and be part of this evening with us. And it's my pleasure at this time to introduce a very, very good friend of uh, Dr. Tracy Caldwell, who also did doctoral work with her, I think at UC Davis, uh, our own chemistry professor, Dr. Jane Gansky, and so she will introduce our speaker. Welcome, Jane. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce our Dean's Lecture Series speaker this evening, Dr. Tracy Caldwell Dyson. Dr. Caldwell Dyson was born here in Southern California, really calling herself a Southern California native. And she completed her bachelor's degree in chemistry at Cal State Fullerton, later pursuing a doctorate in physical chemistry at UC Davis. In 1997, she received a prestigious Camille and Henry Dreyfus postdoctoral fellowship to carry out atmospheric chemistry research at UC Irvine. And it's, it was during that year of her postdoc that she actually received word from NASA that she'd been accepted into the astronaut program. Dr. Caldwell Dyson has logged over 188 days in space, traveling over 5 million miles, first on STS-118. Her shuttle mission was complete in a little over 12 days. Her second mission was a little longer stay and an astronaut's dream the ability to work and live on board the International Space Station for nearly six months. Launching aboard a Soyuz crew capsule from the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan, Dr. Tracy Caldwell Dyson and her two Russian crewmates docked aboard the International Space Station two days later in April 2010. For the next 174 days, she lived and worked aboard the space station conducting a variety of experiments in human physiology, other life sciences and physical sciences, while making observations of Earth from onboard the station. She also completed three successful spacewalks, totaling nearly 23 hours. It would be easy to focus on Dr. Caldwell's impressive academic vita as her road to success as an astronaut, but fewer know that her training probably began when she was a child. At a very young age, she traveled with her father, a licensed electrician, to his job sites, and by the age of 10, was already wiring and carrying her own tool belt. She discovered that she loved fixing things, repairing motorcycles, off-road vehicles, cars, trucks, and driving them probably fast. <laughs> To better prepare herself for the astronaut program, she learned to speak Russian and became a private pilot. She also competed in track and field sports in both high school and in college. Tracy and I worked together in atmospheric chemistry laboratories at UC Irvine the day she received her call from NASA saying that she was accepted into the astronaut program, and I have never seen anyone quite as excited. There was truly a lot of celebration. 
We oftentimes worked on the same ultra-high vacuum chamber, which at one trillionth of an atmosphere of air allows chemists to almost count molecular collisions. It occurred to me that Tracy would be taking her knowledge of atmospheric chemistry to a very different region of the atmosphere, a region which is indeed much more like a vacuum than our own, and a place in which few of us are privileged to venture. Tracy, we're honored to have you at Pepperdine tonight. We look forward to your comments about space travels and your many accomplishments there. Jane, thank you so much. <laughs> oh, thank you. Well, that was one of the most heartwarming introductions I think I've ever gotten, and uh, very moving for me. Jane is, of course, my connection here at Pepperdine. Although I'm a Southern California girl and, and uh, uh, only dreamed of living or going to school in Malibu, I, uh, um, it, it is uh, my close friendship with Jane that, that brings me here tonight. And I'm so excited, too, and, and very, very honored to, to be here. Um, and thank you, uh, Dean Marsh, for, for the invitation to be here. And uh, uh, like I said, Jane is a very close friend of mine, and uh, she's, she's uh, I don't know what she's more of, grace or intelligence, but she's uh, one of the most beautiful people I know inside and out, and that's what she represents to me, and, and uh, it's uh, a joy to be here um, as much to uh, speak to all of you and reminisce about my flight as it is to, to join Jane in uh, her stomping grounds and to share this with her. So um, I want to uh, uh, warn all of you, now you're probably used to in these lectures hearing all about a lot of technical stuff and, and though I do have a PhD in chemistry and a lot of laboratory experience that was in my former life I've been an astronaut for uh, over 13 years now and a lot of the science that I've done uh, is uh, a lot of wrench turning back in my back into my roots of uh, working tools with my dad and but button pushing and uh, learning a little bit about orbital mechanics but uh, so what I'm going to do today or tonight is uh, I want you all to just sit back and relax. This is going to be a, um, a time for you to, to go back into space with me. And I don't want you to think about everybody sitting next to you. I want it to just be you and me. I'm going to take you on a, on a ride uh, on my mission. I get, I think, the most uh, frequently asked question is, oh, so you're an astronaut? So what is it like to be in space? Well, this is, this is my answer, OK? The game plan is that I'm going to show you a video, and then I'm going to go through some slides. And then, as Dean Mars mentioned, I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. And I mean any questions. And trust me, I've, I have been asked them all. So uh, don't be shy. Um, but uh, this video that you're about to see, I just want to preface it a little bit. Whenever an astronaut comes back from flight, be it a shuttle flight or a station flight, they're asked to put together a video uh, presentation that represents their mission. And that's what you'll see tonight. We usually show this, uh, the debut of this uh, video is shown locally in Houston at our Space Center Houston Visitor Center. And this is a chance for all of our uh, Johnson Space Center employees and their families to come and uh, get a look at the video firsthand. It's also a chance for us to, um, to award people that have worked the mission and um, so in this video, I, I've narrated it real time. And so uh, much of the comments and, and commentary you may hear in the background is the audience that it was being presented to at the time. And as Jane mentioned, I did do a few spacewalks on orbit. And I'll uh, um, share with you briefly that we, uh, during the time I was uh, in space in 2010, we had a pretty significant event happened on, uh, on board the space station. For the first time in history, we had a critical failure. And that necessitated going out, uh, outside to do spacewalks to repair a failed pump module. And just to put things in perspective, the, uh, the station lost half of its power. And, if it, and it was just one failure away from losing the rest of it and forcing us to leave the station and come home. And it was not just the 23 hours of spacewalks, it was the hundreds of hours of the people on the ground who helped make that uh, pump module uh, repair a success. 
And so this award ceremony was to honor those people on the ground, the, the incredible amount of teamwork that it took to, to remedy that situation in the time that we had to, uh, uh, to affect the change. And so anyway, that's what you'll see in the video. And then uh, when that's finished, I'll go through the slides with you. So Jordan, if you're ready with the. started well before April 2nd. Alexander Skortov, Mikhail Kolenko, and myself, Tracy caldwell uh prepared for this mission. See Sasha there in the middle, Mikhail there on the right. This is the day before we launch. Our families were uh, invited to observe and escort our rocket as it made its way to the launch pad. Just before going out on the day of launch, we traditionally signed the door to our room in the um, quarantine facility there and biking all with our family behind us. We make our way to the pan where we get suited up and we go for our final leak checks. We are uh, presented in front of the heads of the Russian Space Agency for the final time to uh, salute and say we're ready. We make our way to the launch pad, and there's more people there than I think I ever saw in my life. Certainly more than you see the shuttle launch. We climb inside, get ourselves comfortable, do our final leak checks, and listen to a little bit of music before the engines light. There's a lot of difference between a Soyuz launch and a shuttle launch, which is all I have to compare it to. First and foremost, you suspend, you're suspended from the launch pad, not bolted to it. And liquid engines are a little bit smoother at first than solid rockets, but the first stage lasts about two minutes, same as the shuttle, along with the center stage rocket, which is uh, also running. And about two minutes later, the four strap on boosters are. Uh, Separated, we continue all the way through a first, uh, through a second and third stage, all the way to orbit. Once we get there, uh, we've got docking ahead of us. That's the view through the commander's periscope. We're about 180 meters from the docking. That confirms our uh, docking. And we have our Expedition 23 counterparts waiting for us: Oleg Kota, Suichi Noguchi, and TJ Kramer. It's a real happy moment, as you can well imagine, after spending two and a half days inside of a Soyuz schedule. The station is almost like a resort, and you can't wait to see your friends and take a shower. <laughs> it really is quite a moment. You haven't seen them since they were back in there. most relaxing moment I have before the next day and STS-131 with their engines launched from the pad and made their way towards the space station. Commanded by Alan, Alan Poindexter, piloted by Jim Dutton, Mission Specialist Rick Mastrocchio, Clay Anderson, Stephanie Wilson, Donna McCabe, Lindy Bird, and Jackson's astronaut, Naoko Yamazoka. They docked two days later carrying with them the NPLM full of supplies and science racks, but three EVAs and a lot of robotic mission in front of them. It was significant in many ways. Uh, one, uh, one way was the uh, first time four women were in space together. A good friend of mine and fellow vocalist in Max Q, Dottie Mitt, Kathleen, and I take a, take a moment. <laughs> when the darkness has a hunger that's insatiable, and the lightness has a call that's hard to hear. I'll wrap my 
I feel around me like a blanket. I sailed my ship to safety till I sank it. I'm crawling on your shores. And then we get started with the lead gate. There's Clay Anderson on the left, Rick Mastrocco on the right, Jim Dutton and myself help get them suited up and out the door. All three EVAs. Those guys had a lot of work to do, made it look easy. On my uh, first shuttle flight, 118, I uh, was on board with both Clay and uh, Rick. Stephanie and uh, Naoko and Jim were the main robotic arm operators. That MPLM was their uh, biggest payload. They're responsible for uh, birthing it and unbirthing it. Naoko is the load master and responsible for emptying it and filling it. She did a great job. There's a lot of transfer, as you can imagine. There's the, uh, Seiji and I think Stephanie, or Naoko in the background there. One of the interesting pieces of uh, cargo we brought out of Ampelum was the crew quarters, expanding the U.S. segment subdivision up to three crew quarters. It takes quite a few people to get that activated. Of course, no shuttle dock mission would be complete without a group dinner there in the Node 1 Bar and Grill. We had a traditional dinner of sushi, hosted by Soichi and Naoko, the entire crew there. It's a really good time there in the Node 1. We had a few birthdays on orbit. Suichi and Misha celebrated in April, Sasha in May, myself in August. And after 10 great days, these guys uh, wrapped up an almost flawless mission. It's hard to say goodbye to your friends. It's also kind of strange. The last time I remember seeing Rick and Clay, I was on the shuttle saying goodbye to Clay. This time, Clay was the one going home and I was the one staying. Right there is the Progress 37 on the launch pad, making its way. During our increment, we had several visiting vehicles. Three Progress vehicles came and docked, and three Progress vehicles undocked and made their way back to uh, the atmosphere. All ships bring supplies, much needed, as well as some science hardware. During this time, we also had uh, the 21S crews, Olaf, Seichi, and TJ, had to relocate their Soyuz from the FGD to the SM aft, and that was all in preparation for Atlantis, bringing up the MRM-2 module, sorry, the MRM-1 module, the Russian research module. And there they are, the Atlantis crew, STS-132 ULF-4, commanded by Ken Ham, pilot Tony Antonelli, mission specialist Pierce Sellers, Garrett Reisman, Steve Bowen, and Mike Good. Six-person crew with a heavy, heavy timeline, three EDAs and all the robotics. I was uh, assisting Pierce during all of those operations. There's Ken and a penguin reunion right there. Like I said, these guys were busy. They had a, a hectic timeline. It was the first mission where we got to use the cupola for all the robotic missions, and that's Pierce and I there. It was an invaluable uh, room to be in. All their EVAs were um, focused around uh, batteries, to resupply batteries on the solar rays to uh, help outfit the uh, MRM. During that EDA, I spent time inside the airlock helping get those guys prepared since Garrett and Pierce were running the robotics for that EDA. These guys had uh, lots of uh, challenges. Their OBSS cameras had some uh, tangles that during the EDA they had to go on snarl. These guys had a lot of work to do and they made it look really easy. Some of the greatest views were coming from Garrett's helmet cam. And then, of course, these guys are full of shenanigans. Had the idea, let's have Space Station Olympics, complete with push-ups, pull-ups, Node one hockey. Stupid astronaut trips with Swedish fish and water bubbles. We'll never get enough of that. And I don't know what you call this. Hide and seek. How many guys you can fit in the JLP? Or just 
Kid Ham's crew. But again, another uh, great dinner with our uh, shuttle guys. And as soon as they leave, then uh, Oleg, CG, and TJ get inside of their uh, so you can come uh, home. Uh, comment of International Space Station from you. Я горд принять командование Международной космической станции из рук Олега. Like I said, they get uh, dressed in their slaves, hop in their vehicle, undock, and make their way back to Earth. With uh, half our crew gone, there's a lot more room in the cupola now. Mr. Bolt starts at the altar. It's home, Southern California. The Dead Sea. Sorry, Salt Sea. <laughs> <laughs> Those are mesospheric clouds. They're, they're hard to see and even harder to photograph. I saw quite a few of those during the period of time we were there, just the three of us, and it was pretty cool one night. I realized there's only three people in space, and I'm one of them. Pretty powerful images to see out that cupola. Unfortunately, devastating Gulf oil spills. I want to Then the crew 23, Soyuz 23, carrying with us better new chicken shed, walker, and bed wheel on their way to the International Space Station. We're pretty excited by that point. Looking forward to uh, the addition of our crew, making Expedition 24 for Crew 6. There they are. External cameras on the board of the space station are capturing that. That's probably 10 times the speed <laughs> that a normal approach would take. They docked at the aft end of the SM. With a warm welcome. Shannon Walker in her first trip to space. Pretty excited. No sooner did they get there and unpack their bags, they had to get right back inside and relocate their Soyuz to now the MRM-1, first time ever for uh, docking for the MRM-1. It all went pretty well inside the Soyuz. Those who were in mission control that night uh, <laughs> had a little bit of work to do with uh, things on board the space station got a little more 40. After that, we got right down to business. Uh, there's Wills and I uh, putting back uh, the carbon dioxide removal assembly. Hi, I'm Shannon Walker aboard the International Space Station with my crewmate, Chrissy Caldwell Dyson and Doug Wheelock. We'd like to wish the Houston Texans the best of luck this season. We'll be cheering you on from 220 miles above the Earth. You can start by beating the Colts. Go Texans! We're trying our hardest to make Shannon crack up and mess up. There's Shannon doing some science. Those are spheres, satellites that are driven by CO2 cartridges and uh, trying to understand the technology and navigation systems. Inside the Destiny Laboratory, there inside Columbus, working with the uh, microgravity science glove box, setting up for an experiment. There's Suichi from earlier, working in uh, the Keeble. At, oh, sorry, that's in uh, Columbus at the BioLab. I'm doing a, a neurological experiment called BISI there inside of Destiny. And that's the capillary flow experiment that uh, has its uh, applications in uh, fuel tank design. And inside of uh, Keeble, working with space drums. And Kids in Marco G, where uh, kids compete across the country to develop experiments that get performed on board by astronauts using the, what we call everyday equipment that you find on board. That's the one criteria. Wheels here doing kids in micro G. Uh, students wondering uh, just how water will behave in microgravity. And uh, hypothesis is that it would uh, flow out similar to the way it does on Earth. So you can see it does uh, a little bit different. Can't get it out of there too easily. And then there was 
the day. That was the day our uh, pump module failed, necessitating uh, three spacewalks and one robotic arm option to go out and fix it. That's uh, um, what you heard a lot about tonight. There's Shane getting us suited up, stuffed in the airlock so we can go out and start EVA-1. It was my first spacewalk that we all explored, and we spent most of EVA-1 trying to get that failed pump out of its place. Some folks might uh, recall this room, we had a little bit of trouble with uh, a certain connector, M3. And we uh, pulled out all the stops trying to get that uh, stubborn thing out. Learned more about a QB that night than I uh, had in all the training I'd ever had. We decided to uh, leave that QB in place overnight. It was uh, leaking quite a bit of ammonia. Lots of lessons learned from this night. Decided to uh, keep that QD closed. You can see ammonia there, liberating from the QD. So we just decided to button up things that night and try to attack it in the morning. The next EVA, EVA 16, was all about getting that QD off. And Wheels put all he had into it, and there was much resourcing. <laughs> The rest of that EVA was spent getting that failed pump out of there. There's Shannon Walker, uh, she's at the controls of the robotic arm. You don't see her much in these photos except that big arm that she's uh, moving around quite, uh, quite well, I might add. We got that failed pump out, stowed it away, and then our next uh, task was to get that new pump ready that was on a nearby pallet. You see Rose and I working together there. This is a shot from inside the airlock uh, because we're dealing with ammonia and often uh, came in uh, close contact with it. Ended up having some special procedures before we were able to uh, enter back inside the space station. There's that new pump going back into place. You can see uh, Doug's on the arm there holding the pump and I'm off to the right there guiding it in. And then it was just all about connecting it back together and there was much rejoicing as we had cooling once again. The teams on the ground was, were working feverishly to get the space station back up to full power. Those EVs were a pretty significant uh, event, picking up a couple of weeks on board and uh, putting uh, science on hold for a little while, but then we got right back into it. Earth ops, there was always something to look at. We had Hurricane Alley, it seemed. Something near and dear to my heart was uh, bringing the space station and NASA closer to the, the home of uh, those in the deaf community with through sign language. But this is a good opportunity to take all, all of you to uh, a little tour of the space station, one of our favorite modules, Node 3. Do a lot of exercise in there, as you'll see in a later shot. One of my favorite rooms, I think everybody on board agrees, is the cupola. My crewmates were gracious enough to help me uh, round off this ISS tour in sign language by learning a little sign language of their own. You'll just get a sample here where I'm thanking uh, everybody for uh, coming on board with us. Commander Alexander said, I hope to see you on Earth. Everybody had a speaking role. On the weekends, you talk to your family and friends. Here I'm having a PFC with Max Q and my crewmates there are joining in. I think some of you working on the pump module might, might recognize that musical instrument. People ask what you do on a daily basis. Well, exercise is a huge part of it. That's our treadmill. Our resistive exercise device is in the back there. Thank you, Sasha. I, I, uh, with great honor, I receive uh, and accept uh, command of the International Space Station. Thank you. And with that, we uh, gather our things, say our goodbyes. It's pretty emotional, especially when you spend four months with a group of folks living 
Let me do in space. We got our eyes closed, and then uh, look what happens. The station doesn't want to let go of us. And there's the culprit. Had a gear that uh, wasn't cooperating. Latches wouldn't open. So what do you do? You have to open the hatch, come back out, dig in the trash for all the things that you uh, disposed of because you didn't think you were coming back. Fyodor and uh, Sasha and Misha worked really hard that night to get things back in order so we could try it again the next day. We say our quick goodbyes, climb back inside and try it all over again. This time we had a lot more luck. Said goodbye. It was one of the most emotional moments I think I ever had on board. You just never know when you're going to see something like that again. Once you're in your seat, well, it's about three more hours before you actually touch down. And this is a view after we separate and uh, fall below the station. I believe those are external cameras on the space station. And this is uh, once all the, all the business is over and we're just gliding in on our parachutes. There were about 150 meters from the surface of the Earth. In a moment here, you'll see the force off the landing jet spire, and that is about a meter before we touch down. <laughs> it's hard to describe just what that feels like. <laughs> but, uh, and then, you know, it's all about we come on and get on the Trushka doll that has your face on it and uh, be greeted by the country of Kazakhstan. And that is Expedition 2324. Well, did that give you kind of a feel for what it's like to be in space? A little bit? Do you want to see some more? Because I've got some more. Um, now, uh, this, this slideshow that I'm going to show you guys, it's, it, again, it's, it, it's, I got to thank you because this is a chance for me to get to go back in time. And, and just watching that video uh, puts a big smile on my face and brings back a lot of great memories that um, get me kind of emotional. So you're going to have to bear with me if I start to tear up a little bit because this, uh, you know, this is not just a job, it's your life. Uh, I, know, I know many of you here. Uh, feel that way about the work that you do and uh, when we go into space you know we bring our life with us so the space station is an incredible place and uh, you can't you can't escape when you're there you're, you're, you're you live where you work you work where you live and uh, people that you may not have you know ever picked to live with you're you're there with them and you become pretty tight under some very extraordinary situation um, and circumstances and uh, You've got your family on the ground, and, and they're following along. And then if you're like me, <laughs> um, which there weren't many <laughs> in this situation, but my husband at the same time, uh, who you saw in the video, uh, is a pilot in the Navy. And he was deployed on a ship at the same time I was deployed on the space station. And you can't, you can't call a ship out in the middle of sea who's at war because um, uh, you can't give away their coordinates. Well. It's just as difficult to call the space station. You, you actually can't receive calls at the space station. You can only make them. And so uh, keeping in touch with loved ones is a challenge, uh, regardless of whether your loved one is out in the middle of the ocean on a ship. Uh, so this whole experience of living and working in space, it, it just in, encompasses you in all sorts of ways and changes you. And Jane and I were just talking that, that you just can't come back from something like this the same. So I'm going to try to give you a little feel for that, but I really, really want you guys to, to, to come on board with me and, uh, and love this just as much as I did. This is a, a picture of our space station. It's almost station complete. What you don't see here is a, a new module that we just brought up called the PMM, or the um, Pressurized uh, um, Mini Module. And it's uh, not shown here. And even if it was, you wouldn't see it very well because it's uh, behind. Uh, some of these other modules. But the ISS, the International Space Station, you can basically um, you know, divide it into two parts. It's, it's got an external part and it's got an internal part. The internal parts, of course, are pressurized. The external parts are at vacuum. And so this, this area that you see here, we call this the truss. These are the solar arrays right here. 
And then these are all the modules. This is considered the front of the space station. And the front is the where the, you know, the direction of the velocity vector is. We're, we're going over the surface of the Earth. Aft is over here. This is starboard. This is port. We use ship coordinates, basically. And um, these things you see here are all radiators. That pump module that we uh, changed out is right there. And another thing you can see here, uh, uh, this is um, a robotic arm here, a robotic arm right there. And um, this is a, a European module, a US module, Japanese modules with a platform here to do um, experiments um, uh, in the vacuum of space as well as inside the modules. This is a, also a Japanese uh, module. And then all US modules until you get past this uh, truss segment here, and then everything behind that is uh, our Russian vehicles. We're just learning more space station anatomy here. This is the top view, so if you flew over the top of it, now you see this, the same thing, this, this truss here. You just get to see those radiators a little bit better, and then you can see more of the uh, Russian segment. There's a, uh, um, a, a functional cargo block and a, and a service module, which is really the living quarters. And this part right here, the FGB, was actually the original uh, module, the first module sent into space uh, comprising the whole space station. And then you can see some of our uh, uh, progress vehicles, and, and this is actually our Soyuz attached to the top there. And then you got to see the belly of it, too. We call this the, the, the nadir side of the space station. So this is your, the front. This is the back. But if you're Russian, you consider this to be the front, of course. <laughs> and when you're docking in a Soyuz, all the coordinates on the Soyuz are actually reversed um, from when you're in the shuttle. Um, so they consider this to be the plus x. We always, uh, in, in uh, the orbital mechanical terms that we use, plus x is our velocity, uh, our direction of our velocity. And um, they call this plus x, but when we're docking our vehicles, we call that plus x. <laughs> um, but anyway, the, the thing that I really wanted to show you with this view is that great little spot right there um, attached to our node 3 module, and that's called the cupola. And that's that great window view that we have that's so, so blessed. And this is what the cupola looks if you were outside. And it, all this light that you see is the Earth shining on it. We don't have any external lights on it. And this is uh, one of my crewmates in one of the Russian modules in the back, looking through a docking port, taking a picture of me. And if you didn't see me clearly enough, then here's another <laughs> picture of me. <laughs> I loved this cupola. Um, and it had arrived just before I got there. So I was really, really had great timing getting there. I just can't imagine living there for six months without having that wonderful view. Well, this is what it looks like when you're inside the cupola. And um, this, is, this is how I would spend much of my free time, if I had any at all, <laughs> was looking out this view. And this is the view you see. I don't know, can you guys picture yourself nestled inside this cupola? Now, that picture that you saw of me inside the cupola was taken with a 16 millimeter lens. It kind of, it, it's a little bit of a fish eye, so that it makes the cupola look a lot bigger than it really is. That's the only, and, and actually, the, I took that picture myself, um, because there's no way you could get another person in there with a camera to get that view. So I don't want you to get this sense that you're inside a really big room, okay? You're inside a little bowl, basically. A bowl with seven windows, six around you, one on the bottom. And the way that, you know, remember the cupola is at the nadir end of the space station, the belly of it. And, and in, on most days, we're oriented in space so that the belly of our space station is pointed to the Earth. And that's so that our observation windows I mean, it's got some other uh, orbital mechanical reasons why, but um, it works out great for Earth observations because all of our windows are on the nadir end of the space station pointed at the Earth, so all, most of our camera um, shots are, are from those windows. We do have a few that are off on the sides, but, but very few, and they're not very good optically, uh, optical grade windows um, for some of the really detailed shots that we get. But in any case, you're sitting in this bowl, right? And you're looking out these windows, and um, you just get captivated by views uh, with horizons like this. So I'm going to run through just a, a bunch of these things. So, 
Can we turn the lights down a little bit? So what do you guys think? We're, oh, there's the answer. Can you guys recognize yourselves? This is home. This is, so, so let me get this laser pointer. I don't know if you, can you see any of the, does anybody see any feature? I don't know if, the, if, if you can see the detail or not, but this is where, this is my, my uh, one good landmark here. This is the, the Salton Sea, not the Dead Sea, but the Salton Sea. I, I grew up uh, kind of in this area. So if you, if you fall along this uh, valley right here, this is the San Jacinto Mountains, the San Gorgonia Mountains. And then you see this haze right here. I wonder what that could be. Yeah, OK. You see Catalina Island, the Channel Islands? Where are we, right here? About right there? Do you see the grapevine? You see the Central California? Now, I might be wrong, but I kind of think this is the Grand Canyon. What do you think? And we'd go, we'd go over this lightning fast. And I could be, you know, our, 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 um, one of our exercise devices was, was um, at the opposite end of the cupola. And I would be on that thing doing bench press. And I'd look out that window and I'd go, oh, California. I would just know. I would just know by the terrain. That's, that's a native for you, OK? So anyway, so there's home. You guys see yourselves. That's what you look like. Pretty cool, huh? OK. And there's the other home for me. I've, I've been in Texas long enough. I consider that home as well. Sorry. This is a, you, you, you don't see this kind of detail just looking out the window now. You've got to have a 1,200 millimeter lens. Uh, and we, one of my uh, Russian crewmates was, uh, was just incessant about taking these photos. And we thought he was a spy for a while. Um, some of the photos he was getting of Washington, D.C. and New York and all that kind of stuff. <coughs> He's just a, he's a very artistic guy, and, and uh, so he was having a lot of fun with it. But he took this picture of uh, Houston Forest, and there's a lot of landmarks there that if you lived in that area. Has anybody been to, to this area where Johnson Space Center is? Oh, cool. Okay. Well, so, yeah, the, um, if you're in an airplane, this is, this is Johnson Space Center right here, and people can, can usually see the, the Apollo rocket that we have sitting out front there. Okay, so, um, but you can also see lots of features. This is... Uh, um, a place, uh, the, some mountains in, uh, in the, Andy, the Andes Mountains. So I'm just going to run through some pictures so you can see what, what kind of features pop out at you. Um, and, and some of these are taken with the 1,200 millimeter, but some are just with a, um, an 800 millimeter, a 400 millimeter. Do we have any photographers in the room? No? OK. So, so oh, <laughs> so you play, you, you're you like a lens junkie kind of thing. You know, when I, I, I really never knew much about cameras until I got onto the space station. And it was part of my job. But um, you start to, the, the, more you, you, the more you look out the window, you, you become a photographer. I mean, you just, you can't get enough of taking pictures out the window. And so uh, you start to get a feel for what camera lens works best for the views that you're seeing. And, and it's really cool. You go over. Um, you know, parts of the, of the earth that are, just seem to be barren, and all of a sudden you see like blue pools of water out of nowhere. And uh, I, I apologize, I, I'm not a geography buff, so I'm not going to be able to whip out where we are in, in most of these pictures. Somebody, we actually have a team of people at Johnson Space Center that that's their job to catalog these things and figure out where we were based on our orbital track and all of that kind of stuff. Um, but I was really good at looking out the window and taking pictures of these things, so. <laughs> Kind of proud about that, um, but uh, just some of the interesting land features. Kamchatka was a place of, of personal interest for my cosmonaut crewmates, and they took a ton of pictures of the volcanoes of Kamchatka. We all thought this looked like a horse. Can you can you see it? Can you see it? Here's the head of the horse, and that's the extent of my geology. <laughs> Looks like a horse. <laughs> I'm just a chemist. Okay. Um, Here's another Kamchatka volcano. That was taken, you know, with one of those high-powered lenses. You can't really, from where we, we're 220 miles above the surface of the Earth. We can't look down a volcano like that with our naked eye. Uh, just, you know, more interesting features. There's another volcano, but um, it's very interesting. You look out the window and you, and you see um, some structures that just completely catch, catch your eye. You try to take a picture of it. And it, I don't know if this moves you, but it moves you in, in, in real time. I mean, it's, it's really hard to get a f photograph to, to, to capture the essence of what it is that's just enthralling you at the moment. And it might just be the fact that you're floating in space and you're living the dream, but uh, that volcano was pretty captivating uh, before we snapped the picture of it. 
I don't know what it's doing for you right now, but, <laughs> but remember, we're floating in space. We're in the cupola, OK? You're feeling it, right? All right. And, and you, just, you, can see, you definitely can see features like this with the naked eye. The, the river, I don't believe this was taken with something more than a 170 mil, I mean a, a 70 millimeter lens. And then just, you know, we go over some areas. We, we stay at a, a, a 51 degree incline. And so we don't get too far north. We don't get too far south. And so our, that's our, the direction of, I mean, uh, the, 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 the swath, if you will, of the Earth that we cover um, in our orbit. And so it's, it is kind of cool when you see snow. <laughs> and, um, and we were up there from, uh, from spring uh, to fall through summer. And, um, and so we got to see some changes in the seasons. And it was, uh, it, you, know, you couldn't feel them, but you could see them. It was, it was pretty neat. And then just some pretty uh, famous places. And again, this is probably an 800 millimeter lens. We use that most commonly with what we call our Earth Ops, um, Earth observation photos. And, and we have scientists on the ground that use these. And, and scientifically, they use them they, they, because we've been taking these pictures over the years. And this also goes back to, to our Apollo days um, that we, um, and Skylab. So they've got data um, pictures of the Earth over a period of time from astronaut photos. And you can actually see changes in. Uh, not just major cities, but, but out there in the, in the wide terrain. And we have uh, scientists that are studying uh, these things through the pictures that we take in orbit. Another uh, interesting city. Here's another shot of New York. It's Manhattan Island, and you guys probably recognize Central Park here. And, and the reason the water looks this way is because the sun is setting, and it kind of casts this, uh, this glint on the water it makes it look a little bit grayish, but um, it's just because of the intense uh, glint from the sun. And think about all those canals that you see in, in Italy, in Venice. And the water, the colors are, you'll see some pictures here coming up. They're just shocking. It just um, makes me want, I, I want to go to the Bahamas. Now, I don't know where this is, but, but what you see here is a dam along here. And, and it's just very interesting that the, these are not enhanced. The colors of these are not enhanced. This is, and this is what catches your eye. And even though the scientists on the ground have, or the, you know, the Earth observation folks haven't directed you to take this photo, you're just moved to do it because you're like, that's just weird. And again, this hasn't been enhanced at all. This is what you see, and it just, it just lures you in. And I, I, I want to say this is one of the Hawaiian islands. Um, but again, this is, this is your naked eye looking out the cupola window, and, and you see stuff like this. And I might add, I don't think I mentioned it in the video, but um, does anybody, anybody know how fast you're going when you're staying in orbit? You can give it to me. and. Miles per hour, if you know it. It's t Mach 25, which is 17,500 miles per hour. Yeah, so you're, you're, you're screaming. And even at 220 miles above the Earth's surface, the Earth looks like it's moving pretty fast. And, uh, and so you've you got to be on your game when you've got one of these big honking lenses um, to, to be able to take a shot that's that clear. You've, you've really got to be on it <laughs> it's because it's, it, you're moving pretty fast. And then just some more interesting features. I, you know, I, don't, I, I don't know if I'm boring you with these things, but I can, I, I can still just get totally mesmerized by what is this? I mean, it, this is a pool of water, and it's got some wave action in it, where the rest of this is all just completely calm. And this is out in the middle of nowhere. I mean, we would, we would on some orbital tracks, you know, you, you shift in your orbital track. And so for like two weeks, you're kind of going over the same kind of land mass. And sometimes you're over water for, for it seems like eternity when, the sun, when you're synced up with the sun. And it's, um, it's very eye-catching when you see a piece of land. You're like, whoa, camera, <laughs> I need to take a shot of that. Where was that? And then you're asking the Earth Ops people on the ground, what was it that we flew over and it, at GMT? You know, the, the, we, we tell time in green, Greenwich Mean Time. And so we'll ask them. And they'll tell us if they know. It's really uh, fascinating, some of the things we see out there. 
I was on board with uh, Suichi Naguchi from Japan, and so there were a lot of pictures that he was taking of, uh, of his homeland, some interesting uh, features too. And um, I never really thought of Japan as having snow before <laughs> until, <laughs> until I lived up on the space station and saw it for myself. Okay, now here are the pictures. Did I just hear someone yawn? <laughs> I'm getting to some good stuff here. Now this is the Bahamas. This is the, this is the most intense blue you, you'll ever see. And I don't think that this screen does it, does it at all justice, but this is something that no one can tear themselves away from the window when they see this. I hope I'm not blocking your view. But just look at this. I mean, what? is that? <laughs> I want to go in a kayak there. <laughs> Don't you? It's just, it's just fascinating. Again, I can't, I, I, can't just, I, I can't make this color jump out at you, but it would if you're, you're still in the cupola with me, right? Right now? Right? This color would be gripping you at this time. It's just amazing. And you can see depth. I mean, you're, you're, this is two-dimensional, but it's, it's there. It's three-dimensional to you when you're laying in that cupola. Remember, you want to know what it's like to be in space? I would get tears in my eyes, and I wouldn't know it. You know why? Because when you're floating in space, your tears float too. Here, when you cry, tears fall, and, and they clear out of your eye socket, right? In orbit, your eyes well up, and the tears stay right there. And sometimes I wouldn't even know I was crying until I couldn't see anymore. And I was like, what is that? <laughs> and then I couldn't get rid of it. I mean, I'd try to move it, but it, it would just smear all over my face. <laughs> so think about that, too. You're in the cupola with me, and you're floating, right? Your, your eyes are water, watering, and they won't, they won't clear. And you're like, I just want to see it. And I can't. <laughs> So anyway, <laughs> I was alone in the cupola. You guys don't tell anybody. Um, so anyway, yeah, I mean, and the, and the Bahamas are just, just strange shapes, and, and I, I want to go there. OK, enough of the Bahamas. This is, these are the things you see, contrails of planes. You see wakes from boats. You can see large wave action, too, along shorelines. All with your naked eye. You don't need to have a, a magnified lens for that. And it's kind of cool when you see contrails of planes. You're like, oh, there's other people flying, too. Not as high as me, but there's people flying. But anyway, um, one day I saw these uh, outcroppings, and I was like, oh, that's got to be Everest. And I took a picture of it, and I sent it again to the, my Earth observation folks. And they said, no, they're just mountains, Tracy. I was like, OK. So I'll, I'll stop trying to play a geologist. Um, and then we were up there during hurricane season, and so we, we uh, had quite a bit of hurricane activity, especially in the Gulf area. And uh, we took a lot of shots. And um, what uh, often happens is that the, the meteorological, me meteorological groups out there often take uh, these hurricane photos and sometimes uh, show them on the news because uh, you don't often get that perspective. Um, but I'm trying to find a really good shot of it. But this. If you ever wondered what the eye of a storm, has anybody ever lived in an area where there's hurricanes? Have you been in a hurricane? Right in the eye. And, and is it not like, it is very calm. very calm. Very calm. Yes. And when you're flying over the eye of this thing, you're like, you're looking at it, waiting to see houses swirling around. And it's, there's nothing. It looks, it looks serene. Even when you're flying over the top of it, it, it really is. Uh, calm in the eye of the storm. Really fascinating. But it's also heart-wrenching. Um, it's, it's a beautiful sight from, from the cupola, but you're also you're, you're, you're in angst because you know there, there are people um, you know, filling up their trucks with gas and getting out of, <laughs> out of that area. I know. I live in Houston. I've had to do that myself. So. Um, but it's amazing the, 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 the area that these things can cover. The storm system is, is thousands of miles. It's, it's fascinating. So you just see all these uh, interesting features in the, in the storm systems. Oh, and then there's the moon. Oh, yeah, you know what? I, see, th see this color right here, this blue? I was trying, my mom is a, like an like a amateur artist, and, and uh, so she, she, she really can appreciate my um, angst over this. I was trying, I told her when I went on the shuttle that I, would, I had tried to 
to draw that blue that I saw of the atmosphere. And so I told her that when I went on the space station, I was going to do my best to, to recreate this. I was going to take watercolors. And I tried, I tried for like a week to try to get this color represented. I'm no artist, and so it was even worse. But mom was able to put black paper on a, a progress ship that came up in one of my care packages. She put black paper up there and gave me these uh, metallic pencils. And with those, I was able to recreate a little bit better um, this atmosphere. And let me try to describe this for you. This blackness of space, it's, it's blacker than, it, you just don't know what black is until you're in space. And then there's this, this magical blue glow that changes colors. And, and remember, you're, what you're seeing here, it kind of looks like you're in the atmosphere. And in a later shot, you'll, you'll be able to see what I'm talking about. But the atmosphere, you know, there's this layer. And what you're seeing the, at the altitude we are, you, you see the top layer of the atmosphere, but then you see the curvature. And it's where, and then you're looking through the atmosphere, and you see the other, the, the curve of the atmosphere in the same layer that you're looking at. And it, and it creates this. Um, these layers of blue that you can't even you can't even duplicate with with paint, let alone with words. It's just one of the most fascinating things that. And then when the sun goes down, and you've got let's say a moon out, and the moon casts a silver light on this blue atmosphere, it's even freakier because now you're looking at at instead of blues meshing together, you're looking at at distinct silvers. Um, God, am I even making sense? You know what I'm talking about? It's just, it's just amazing, the perspective. And then you put the moon up there, and it's just, uh, you're in Wonderland. I'm not making this up, you guys. This is, you're in the cupola with me still, right? <laughs> Did anybody get out of the cupola? I want to know. Okay, we're still in the cupola. So yeah, that moon is just as striking in space as it is uh, here um, I mean, if anybody has climbed up to Yosemite or, or gone somewhere, you know, where you're away from all the light pollution and seeing the stars and seeing the, the moon, and, and, and sometimes it's so, the stars are so immense that you can't even make out a constellation. Have you been there? Yeah. Well, that's what it's like in space. And you've been into a planetarium before, the dome? That's what it's like in space. <laughs> I mean, you feel like you're in, you're in one of the most magnificent planetariums um, ever built. Well, you are, basically. And so it's, uh, it's no less captivating. And then with that, with that high-powered lens, the 1,200-millimeter lens, you get to see that kind of great detail. And this is, a, I've got to give the uh, credit to my cosmonaut crewmates. Um, in their crew quarters, they have a window. We don't on the US segment side. But in their crew quarters, they have windows off to the side, which allow them to get in complete darkness. It's really hard to, to accomplish that in the rest of the space station for all the pumps and, and lights and things. And so it's really hard to get great detailed pictures like this in the dark. And, but they're able to do that with their, um, with their crew quarters and also with their camera equipment. It's really uh, pretty fascinating. Uh, some of the photos that they've been able to get. Anyway, I couldn't get enough of this moon, and just the, just the the magic of the moon setting when it. Uh, and I'll show you a picture here later. Yeah, moon sets. They're really cool. When this moon starts to get, um, in you know, in your field of view, it goes behind the atmosphere. You know, like here on Earth, when you look out at the horizon and you see the sunset, it kind of looks gigantic. And when the moon, you know, when the moon's up, it looks gigantic. When it, when it's, when you're in space and you're above the atmosphere and you're looking at the moon setting through the atmosphere, it really distorts it. It almost elongates it from your point of view. And one time, the sun was setting just right on the moon. That it looked, it looked on fire. In fact, when I looked, I, I didn't realize it was the moon. I actually thought a lake or, or a body of water on the Earth was on fire. And then I looked again, I realized that was the moon. And it was, um, I, and, I, and I just wished that I was more uh, talented with a, photo, with a camera that I could capture that, because I don't know that I can describe it and do it justice. And, and I have this here. Uh, this, is, this is if you were looking at the space station you know, in, 
and the orientation that you're in right now with it being upright, this is kind of the direction you would be inside the cupola, um, pointed down, basically, right? Because the cupola is on the belly. Um, but I wanted you to pay attention to, to so here's the earth, and, the, and, and you see this uh, lighting on the earth, on the, on the water surface, and that's the sun glint, and the sun's about to set. And so what I wanted to show you with this picture is that the sun is setting, right? And, and do you notice how dark it is here? This is the terminator. And that's the, the, where, where the sun has set on the earth, right? It's, it's pitch black. And you, unless you're over a, a densely populated area, which most of the world is not, um, it is pitch black. You, can't even, you don't even know there's a planet down there uh, uh, it, for how dark it gets. And I was telling a group earlier that that, that terminator, that, that, that blackness of the earth, it, when the terminator is coming, it, it's, it's kind of eerie. It, it's, it's this blackness coming upon you. But it's, but it's an eerie that you can't resist. You're looking at it, and you know you're safe, but it's like the earth is going away, and it's, it's, uh, but it's captivating again. So anyway, just more of sun glint. I, I was always captivated that, by that. And again, this picture doesn't do it justice, but the, this color, it looks kind of gray here, but it's actually an, like a pearlescent yellow. And it has oranges and pinks, and then some blues mixed in, and, it, and it's ever-changing. Like, if you're watching it, you don't blink, because it's going to look different, and you're going to miss it. And it's just alive. It's, again, pretty captivating. And then, if, if the Earth itself wasn't fascinating enough, you've got this incredible thing called the International Space Station. And I'm here to tell you, hardware never looked so cool as it does in space. And you know, this space station wasn't built and put together on the, on the planet here. It was built in space. It was put together in space. And the fact that those things all come together and, and they work is, is just a, um, a marvel, an engineering marvel. And the fact that, that all of these countries came together to put it um, together um, makes you um, want to be a part of it, uh, for sure. And so you're, you're just as captivated by this space station. These solar arrays are constantly moving right, to track the sun. And when the sun hits them, they, they, they turn this bright orange. Right now, you're looking at the back side of them, and those, um, those cells that you see are actually like a blue color. Um, but the way that the sun is sit, hitting on it, it, it uh, casts a shadow. But as soon as the sun comes up, these solar rays are the first ones to let you know. And they turn, they turn this, this great orange like a toaster oven, you know, like the filaments in your toaster. It's pretty cool, especially when there's this blackness and you can't see anything, and all of a sudden the solar rays wake up. It's, it's pretty cool. And then, you know, here's, uh, you're, again, you're looking out um, the cupola, and um, you can see the, the aft part of the space station, and you see here a, um, a progress vehicle and a Soyuz vehicle. That's looking behind you. And this is looking at, actually, a shuttle has been docked. And this is a shuttle window. And this is a view you rarely get and we won't get from, from now on. Um, and this is the, the port side of the space station, the front of it, the Japanese module. Um, and the whole complex on the Japanese side is called Kibo. And it has uh, this small module here and this long laboratory and then this outside platform that we have a robotic arm that moves these boxes around and brings them back inside. We have an airlock just for these things. And then you see in the background here the truss segment that holds all of the equipment for the space station. And this is the sun setting um, on Keeble. There's that terminator I was telling you about. This is a view of the progress vehicle docking, looking aft on the space station. This is the uh, service module, uh, called Zvezda. Sorry, going the wrong direction. And just a photo of a spacewalker out there. And, it, and I like this photo because I don't know if this gives you the sense of that you are, when you're in that spacesuit, you are your own satellite. You're out there, and you're dangling. <laughs> I mean, you're, you notice he's got nothing under his feet, and when he, when, and, I, and this was one of our crew members on the shuttle doing a, repair, a replacement of a battery. Um, you know, when you're in that suit and you look down and <laughs> all you see are your little toes and then the earth. 
And the Earth's, remember, remember how fast the Earth's going? Did anybody? Yes, and that's fast. Going right under your toes. A little distracting. And I like this shot because it's, um, it's just so cool. You've got uh, a shuttle docked here, and then you get to see all of our robotic arms that are on board the space station and the, and the space shuttle combined. So this is uh, the, the robotic arm on the shuttle, and it's attached to this long sensor boom that we've got. We, we put that in place after Columbia accident. Um, you know, they had some damage on uh, a heat shield of their wing. And if we had a system like this, we possibly could have um, uh, mitigated that loss. But, um, but that's, you know, the, the bright side is that we came up with things to protect ourselves in the, in the future. Anyway, enough of that story. The, um, this is the, the big arm, we call it. This is the, the robotic arm on the space station. Then we have this little robot guy here called uh, the SPDM, or we call it Dexter. And uh, he's basically a, a manipulate, like you can think of it as a hand a big, big hand that goes on the end of the space station and is uh, meant to assist um, us in, in repairs outside the space station uh, when we can't go out EVA. Just some more cool shots of the vehicle with the um, space shuttle docked. And this is those uh, solar rays I was telling you about when they start to glow. And then they, the, here they cast a, a glow on the uh, payload, ba reflected off the payload bay doors of the space shuttle. And here's just a little trivia. This, this thing right here is uh, inside the payload bay is actually the uh, MRM-1 module. It's a mini research module. And it was uh, um, uh, attached to the, to the Russian side of our space station during this mission. And that's afterwards when they were going home, empty payload bay. And this is their, again, their robotic arm with the boom sensor. Just some more shots of that glowing uh, toaster filament there. And uh, I kept this one here just to show you guys Libya. Um, but when you go over uh, desert areas in, um, in the Middle East, it's, uh, it's pretty noticeable. The colors of the, of the earth, like when you go over Australia, I think that's the next one. Uh, no. When you go over Australia, the, 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 the dirt is this, this reddish orange that's unlike anywhere else in the world. So whenever you go over Australia, you're just looking out the window, you know automatically that's Australia because nowhere else on Earth has that color of, of, uh, of Earth. And you start to recognize these things after living there for, for six months. Um, and, and so deserts in the Middle East have a much different color, dirt. <laughs> this, is, this is my level of intelligence when it comes to talking about geography. But <laughs> the color of the dirt is different. So this is, again, uh, Southern California. Again, my landmark is that Salton Sea. And uh, whenever we'd float over California, I'd have to call down a mission control and tell everybody like they were all from here, <laughs> like they'd appreciate it as much as I did. So again, there's SoCal. Again. So you see there's Baja, California there, Salton Sea. It's kind of hard to make out Malibu from here. Again, Bahamas. You guys are tired of the Bahamas, aren't you? No? Really? OK. Let me go back. Let's watch. <laughs> I love these pictures. Oh my gosh. OK. I'll, I'll try to get through them. But um, yeah, it's just, you keep taking pictures of the same place like you'd never been there before, because you're just captivated every time. Um, and this is, remember I was telling you about that mini research module. Well, now it's attached to the space station. And, and then uh, our colleagues, the ones you guys saw come up, uh, Fyodor, Shannon, and Wheels. Uh, his name's Doug Wheelock. His call sign is Wheels. I apologize um, for the confusion. But they, they were the first ones to, to dock to that um, module. And, and in astronaut terms, that's kind of cool. <laughs> we don't expect everybody to get excited over that kind of stuff. But to be the first to dock to something on the space station kind of leaves your mark. This is a, actually my commander let me uh, take some photos out of his bedroom window. And this was my, uh, my first one. And I kind of liked it. This have, has a nostalgia, nostalgic uh, value to it for me. Um, because I, uh, I just I love that horizon. It's just, it's just so infinite. It's like I can't believe how big that is and how small I am.
and I'm looking at that. And I'll tell you what, too, that um, it hit me while I was uh, up there that, you know, especially when I was looking at the stars and when, and my colleagues didn't tell me about this until, uh, well, they didn't tell me, period, but um, I was quite surprised on my first shuttle flight even that when I was looking out the window, you know, I looked at the stars and um, here, you know, when you look up, the stars are blinking, right? And that's because y there's an atmosphere between you and those stars and you're watching the light diffract and bounce off of that. And so it blinks, uh, in your perception, it blinks. But when you're above the atmosphere, like you are in a space station and a space shuttle, you don't see the stars blinking. There's no atmosphere between you and those stars. And so it's, it's solid light. But then, also, when you're back here on Earth and you're looking up at the stars, they all look like they're in the same plane, right? You, you can't really distinguish depth in the stars. But when you're above the atmosphere, you actually can. The stars, they, you can actually detect the depth of stars. Like those graphic arts that you see where if you focus beyond, if you put your focal point beyond the picture, the plane of the picture, the picture bounces out at you and you see this 3D image. That's exactly what it's like when you're in that cupola looking out at those stars. They bounce out at you. And you feel like you're in a bowl of stars. And, and it's incredible. And, 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 and you know, then you geek out. And I feel like I can do that here. That uh, you guys all, you know, your, your, your eye is detecting light years. You know, you know that, that it takes a few of those between stars. And there you are. Your eye is seeing that difference in light years. And I think about something as, as infinitely huge like that. And then I think about our human race and how big it is when you go way back in time when we first started and, and how many people have, have lived on this planet. Billions. And then you think about how many people have got to see it from that vantage point. And that fraction is also, also billionth. And that's when you, when, you, when you feel pretty privileged. And if that doesn't take your breath away, I don't know what does. But. And that's a view looking out our, uh, our rear view mirror. You get to see where you've been. Okay, I'm sorry, more solar rays, they're really cool. I want to get to some of these videos. I do have some shots that I wanted to show you guys. This is cool. More, you know, this, where else are you going to see Russian solar panels, US solar panels, and thermal radiators? Do you guys get excited about this? <laughs> I do. I mean, when you look out that window and you see that stuff turning and it doesn't run into each other, it's the coolest thing ever. I can't get you excited over this, can I? I'm sorry. OK, here we go. More, more shuttles. Again, it's just kind of cool because these shuttles, they, they come up about 600 feet from the space station and they do a backflip and that's so that we can take pictures of their belly to make sure that there's no damage on the, on the tiles. And, um, and then they come in for a docking, they swoop in front of us and then they apply their brakes and it's just jets firing in the other direction. They slow down and then they dock to the front. It's, it's really pretty classy the way that, that it gets done. Um, It's not just the shuttle, it's the shuttle with, with coastline. <laughs> OK. And more robotic arms. Sorry, you guys. There they are. This is Australia. That's the color. I, and, and again, I don't know if you can see the difference, but um, it is a really bright reddish orange uh, uh, soil that you just don't see in any of the other continents. And um, yeah, just I don't know if it was very clear from the video, but the Soyuz capsules are the ones that, that the humans ride in. The progress vehicles are the cargo ships that bring the, uh, the supplies. They're, they're almost identical, um, except that this can be um, manually flown from the inside, and uh, this cannot. But you can control this from a um, control panel inside the space station if you need to. But they're both meant to be, they're both designed to be docked um, automated, automatically. So it, 
it, you, the human gets in the loop only if there's a problem. Unlike the shuttle, which, which you train for years to, to, to fly that thing, it, it is a completely manual um, vehicle, except during the, the dynamic phases of launch. Another view on the, from the belly, uh, belly of the space station. And then there's that Terminator. More Terminator, and this is just a series showing the Terminator getting bigger and bigger as the sun sets. And that Earth becomes just black. There's nothing there. Isn't that cool? You guys still in the cupola with me? I mean, is that, that's just some pretty, I mean, this, the, the features you can see in that sunset with the clouds, it's just, you don't want it to go away, but that sun is just setting like a banshee. <laughs> it's just, you're like, don't go. There it goes. And then there's moon again. And this is kind of a picture of the moon. It, it's starting to distort. This was the best picture I could find where the moon kind of distorts a little bit, but I couldn't find anything that was um, close to some of the extremes that I saw while I was up there. And, and again, I don't think you can see the detail in this picture, but, but when that sun has set and you see this blue glow and the, and the shadow that's, or not the shadow, but just the glint of light, you still see some incredible detail and features because of the angle that the sun is hitting and it, and it illuminates things that you don't see when the, when the sun is directly overhead. So it's, it's fascinating every position that sun takes. And that's a sunrise. Oh, you know what? It, it cut off the... Um, it cut off the, the mesospheric clouds. I don't know if anybody's heard of those things. Oh, you think that's cool. Wait. So auroras are, are the, this, the, the cat's meow up there, but check this out. And that's sped up quite a bit, okay? That's... Um, Mike Fossum up in space right now, increment 29, he took that. Let me show it again, right, because that was cool. Um, yeah, he, what he did was set, he's a, he's a marvel with this camera, and he set it up inside the cupola at night, and he had it set to take a, a shot like every second. And what he did was put it together in a movie, and, and watch the solar ray. It's tracking pretty fast, so, so this is a lot faster than the, the actual speed, but gives you a, a feel for how that light dances around. It is amazing. I mean, if you ever wondered what ionization looks like. <laughs> and I know you have, because I'm in a room full of geeks, I bet, right? <laughs> I've been waiting for this moment. I hang out with engineers, and they're not the same type of geek. OK, where'd my little thing go? I'll get back. All right, you guys don't mind me calling you geeks, do you? All right. Geeks unite. I've been waiting for this. All right. So it's cool to be a geek. So city lights. These are also pretty hard to photograph because anybody that does photography knows that you need, you need light. And, uh, and these take really slow shutter speeds uh, to get all the light it can. And when you do that, any kind of bump, it gets uh, blurs the image. So it, it, getting night shots are really tricky. but. And this, I'm sorry, that it kind of cuts it off, but Atlantic City is, you can actually see Atlantic City up there, too. Any, anyone from that area? Yeah? Oh, there's home. Pretty cool. Tokyo, again, I was up in space with Suichi. When my husband was stationed not too far from there while I was up. He was on a ship, but, but his base was in Atsugi, Japan not too far from Tokyo. And I believe this is Odessa, because my uh, commander's uh, brother and father live there. And I remember him showing me this picture. But what I like so much about it, not just because Sasha and his uh, endearing comments about Odessa, but um, 
This is the moon. And it casts this beautiful blue shadow on this city of light. It was, again, mesmerizing to see that. Okay, you guys ready to take another ride? Okay, see if I can get this one to go. Same, same type of photography he did there, just captured a little bit longer period. So, so what did you guys notice in that picture? Anybody want to, what's that? A lot of cities. What else did you guys see in that picture? The green atmosphere. That's good. Looked kind of funky, didn't it? What else did someone see? There's a lot to see in that, in that video. Did you guys see the lightning? Did you guys see the, um, of course you saw the, the sun setting. And did you see the lights it was casting on the space station? And you saw the uh, solar rays turning? Oh, we, no, that's not part of the presentation. <laughs> Lightning. And watch the structure up here. Pretty cool, huh? Now, to be honest, I think the green glow of the atmosphere there is really just an effect of the camera that we're using. It's a it's a Nikon DX3, and it and it our photography um, instructors say it creates light. Um, it's a great night camera, and so what it actually does is it. Um, it, it does kind of distort colors a little bit that make the um, silver lining of that atmosphere look green, but it's actually kind of silvery in real life. But the, uh, um, the, the, the thing I wanted to mention about the lightning is we, we watched plenty of storms up there, and you just be, um, next time you're in a lightning storm, think about this. I mean, lightning can, can it, it's fast, right? I mean, it goes for thousands of miles. And, and we'd watch a storm system just cover an entire continent. It was amazing to watch the same um, bolt of lightning dance all the way across thousands of miles. It was, it was unreal. I I'd, I'd never would have believed it. And the cool thing is, is it's like a strobe effect on the space station. It lights up the belly of the space station. It's, it's pretty cool. We're not going nearly that fast, but... Uh, Oh, and then here's just a few of my favorite, and I'm almost done, you guys. So just some of the fun stuff. Um, Misha and I just kind of, I was actually making myself some food, and I hung upside down and in, the, in the station, the way that the station is oriented in, in 1G, we say. I was upside down making my food and turned around and shot this camera. But I like it because it reminds me of Misha, and he's, uh, he's like a brother to me. And uh, in firsts, we were the first to have four people living in the, U in the U.S. segment. Um, in the video, you saw us installing the third one, which is the one Misha's in. But just before I left, we installed the fourth one here. Shannon was uh, in our Japanese module in this crew quarter, and we moved it over here to make uh, the quadrant of uh, crew quarters, which makes it really cozy uh, for all of us living there together. And then some of the routine stuff. I did maintenance all the time on Space Station. This is our carbon dioxide removal assembly. And it's a pretty much a big monster of valves and, and uh, QDs and connectors and things like that. And I'd have to work on that um, and things like that on a routine basis. And uh, what you don't do on a regular basis are EVAs or spacewalks. And in fact, What's kind of different about the spacewalks we did, other than the fact that they were conti co called contingency, you know, they weren't planned, um, but uh, they're called stage EVAs. You know, most of our EVAs, our spacewalks, have been done when a shuttle is docked. This was done when no shuttle was docked, and that's why you don't have a whole lot of great pictures of, of uh, the two of us outside in spacesuits because we don't have um, a lot of view, a lot of views of where we were, like you do when a shuttle is docked, where you get a lot of pictures of. of folks outside. But this is uh, um, the longest, the first EVA that we did was the longest EVA um, 
uh, in the station's history for a station crew. And it's kind of, um, I don't know if, if it's as important a point to make here, but it's really a testament to um, how we do business on board this space station that we can do that um, you know, without a shuttle dock. We had a lot of um, reservations about being able to do this type of a spacewalk. We call this a big, they call it the big 14. And the big 14 are the big, the 14 most critical boxes on the space station, boxes being a pump, um, you know, a, a, a big box with batteries. Um, if it fails and, and, and we don't have uh, time to get it running again, we've got bad problems. And we, we categorized the, the top 14 of those, and this was the biggest of the big 14. And, and whenever we trained for it, whether it was in the control room or it was in these spacesuits, we always thought, you know, it'll never happen. And it did. And, and, and it was one of those uh, cases where you just had to kind of muster, you know? Uh, we weren't planning to go out and do this, and it was my first EVA, my first spacewalk. And, um, but all of us knew that we had a job to do going out there. Um, but deep down inside, I think everybody was like, holy cow, I, we never thought this was going to happen. And what I think I'm most, um, what I feel like is, is the most blessed part of this is being a part of a team of people that made this thing um, a success. And we got a lot of, uh, of attention, Wills and I, for going outside in these puffy white suits. But it, the, the people who did the, the most work were the people that were in our mission control and the people at Johnson Space Center. And all the scientists that had um, their work up on board that space station that had to come to a complete halt until we got cooling back on the station. And I've never seen a group of people with various um, backgrounds, various interests, and stock in this space station. You've got flight controllers who are interested in keeping this vehicle running. You've got scientists who have science on board that they want, that they're getting, I mean, I'm talking to a group of people who know how important data is. But when this thing happened, everybody realized the magnitude of it and pulled together to do what was right. And this wasn't just in the United States and in Houston. This was across the world. We have control centers in Germany. We have control centers in Canada, in Russia, and in Japan. And everybody pulled together. And wow, when you get to be a part of that and live your dream too, um, you just don't know that there is um, any more blessing that you could ask for than that. I don't know if you guys could indulge me, but have you ever wondered what it was like in Mission Control? Um, has anybody ever been to Mission Control in Houston? Have you? Did you get to go in there while they were running a mission, or? Oh, bummer. Well, I don't. I I know I'm taking up a lot of your time, but I've got some audio here of the of when the event happened. If uh, we have some time, I can play that for you. Um, let me let me cue it up because um, so you guys know this is a big failure, and um, what mission control is like. You saw it. it. It's a big room. You probably were looking through glass windows. Yeah, and there's huge screens. And if you saw it in action, you'd see a flight director. And you got, anybody seen Apollo 13? OK, so you, you, you know what mission control is like. You've got a flight director, the boss, the big banana um, there that's running all of the flight controllers. And all of the different disciplines in that uh, mission control center um, run a particular component of the space station. So you've got the thermal control system, the electrical system, the motion control system, the life support system. And um, the, uh, all those controllers in the room are managing that system. They're basically engineers that understand the, the way that that thing operates. And the space station is so complex that it takes a room of people, experts, to run it. If, if that um, failure happened and we weren't talking to the ground, there's no way that we, the crew, could have uh, saved the whole system in the amount of time that we had because there are so many commands that have to be sent to several different systems. It really took that team in mission control. But, um, but then outside of that is a, a whole group of people on the back rooms that are the engineers who actually kind of built the systems. And so they're the, the people who designed it and know it from the inside out. And so all those people make up the teams in mission control. And so this first one is, um, 
you know, this was this happened on a Tuesday night at around 11:30 p.m. and I was uh, I was I'm the I was the US, U.S. segment lead, and um, it was my job to kind of clean up the space station in the evenings and get it buttoned down, ready for bed. And I had just finished uh, turning off the treadmill, and I had seen a strange signature, unrelated to the the failure that we all know happens later. But I was talking to the ground in the middle of of that, um, trying to uh, rectify the the anomalous signature I was seeing. Round two, proceed to. Go ahead, Chris. Okay, just to close the loop with you, we did verify that P2 is in a good config for overnight. However, to uh, further troubleshoot that uh, the PCS message you got. That's the one. This was at a caution. Flight Varen, I see okay. it. This is not expected, but there's no action for the crew. And Flight Varen, I see the warning again. Not expected. Taking a look. No action for the crew. Station Houston, Space Ground 2. We see the warnings. Uh, they were not expected. No actions right now. We'll get right back to you. Chris, can you repeat that call on Space Ground 1? Station Houston, Space Ground One. We see your messages. And I was asking him and, to uh, no that immediate because action the guys in the Russian we'll segment wouldn't we, uh, have heard it have otherwise. Okay, we're standing by. Flight sign. All right, Spartan, what do we got going on here? The loose alpha pump has failed. Pump. I'm not sure of the cause yet, but I'm taking a look that there's no cooling. Loose so alpha channel. EPCS pump package has failed? That's correct, Flight. I feel like I do see a loss of pump with that pump. And that's expected. Okay, so we have no cooling right on ETCS loop alpha. That's correct. And do you have any immediate actions for the crew? Negative flight. Okay, what, what warning procedure are you going to be stepping into? And flight, okay, or sorry, flight starting to me in one second. Okay. So they're pretty calm, uh, but you can tell that uh, the room just heated up a little bit, as well as on station. This next uh, clip, I just have to share because it makes me laugh a little bit. Um, let me define the console position so you know you've got the flight director. You're hearing the voice, that, that, that uh, woman's voice you hear, is, uh, her console position is called Spartan. And uh, she's the, overnight we have a reduced manning inside the space station. Again, this was 1130 GMT time. And um, this console position handles the external thermal control system as well as the electrical system. So her, her console position is Spartan. The other name that you'll hear is MER, which stands for Mission Evaluation Room. And those are the engineers, the backroom engineers, who basically understand the design of the component that's in question. And so what you're hearing is uh, Flight Director Spartan and uh, the MER manager, who is uh, basically the flight director equivalent of that mission evaluation room. And this is where, this is the audio where the flight director, Chris, realizes the magnitude of the situation. Go to proceed. Copy. Flight sign. Go, Spartan. Okay, the data dump was performed. Um, it's still on the ground. I got words that our MER isn't going to be here for another 15 minutes. They're on their way in. Once they get here, it should be another 15 minutes so we have an answer. MER manager flight. Flight. Okay, I don't want anybody speeding or breaking any, you know, running any red lights or anything, but I want you guys to have a, a you could have a workstation ready to go. Do anything you can to, to expedite the analysis. So we don't risk uh, over temping the equipment. Copy that. Okay. Is Spartan, Spartan flight? Go flight. Okay. Uh, the next thing I'd like you to do is uh, take take a deep breath for a minute or two, and then uh, start working out the two paths. One is that we get good results, and we can do a repower on the, the pump module, and the other is we got to shut down. Okay, fine. I think I'm ready for that. And and just just for my awareness, just verify this understanding. Each. ETCS loop has just one pump module, right? That's correct. And how many power sources does that one pump Just one RPC. 
I was afraid of that. There's like... <laughs> It cracks me up every time. You know, of course, um, those of us inside the space station, we, we knew that there was a, a big deal happening because we, sim, we would simulate that often in our emergency sims. Um, but uh, we just had no way to anticipate that that was ever going to happen to us. Now, I'm going to just breeze through these. Um, I, I don't have to elaborate. Doing a spacewalk was a dream come true for me in many, more ways than, than I think you could even imagine. Um, I, w I don't know if you can tell by my build, but I wasn't really built to, to operate that suit. And I had to really prove myself. And even if when I felt like I had, I hadn't. And it took a serendipitous failure of a, um, of a pump uh, to do this EVA and to prove that I could actually do it. Uh, an unplanned, a contingency EVA involving the most toxic substance on our station and the largest fluid QDs. Uh, under a time critical situation, and uh, I couldn't have, I couldn't have asked for more. And uh, this is where I really felt God's blessing upon me. And I, all I wanted was one EVA, and I got three of them. Um, so, anyway, there's a lot more to that picture than uh, I could even describe. And then this again is uh, um, when my my psych docs. I have a team of uh, psychi psychologists that um, are assigned to each one of us. And we have a meeting with them every week uh, while we're on board. And about three weeks before I left the station, they said, so Tracy, what are you going to miss the most? I said, I'm going to miss that cupola. They said, you should take a picture of it. And so for the next three weeks, I, <laughs> I worked on this picture. So I would never forget uh, what that was like. So who we have up on board right now is Expedition uh, 29. These three guys right now, and uh, pretty soon the other three guys are going to be uh, launching to meet them. So we're already at Expedition 29. It's been over a year since I've been there. If you guys are wondering what this thing looks like, um, we missed it tonight. But don't fret. Saturday night, I hope it's clear skies. Because at 6.52 PM, you're going to have an unprecedented six-minute pass going over your area. You just, uh, the, the, I don't know if you guys are familiar with this site, site at spaceflight.nasa.gov. You can navigate your way through real data and sightings by city and come up with this place. And, um, and for this area, um, it's going to start at 10 degrees northwest. And so if you picture, you know, zero degrees and 90 degrees, 10 degrees above the horizon uh, to the northwest, start looking there. And then you'll see it go across the horizon to southeast. And that'll be six minutes long. That is huge. And I just encourage you to look at it, because it really affirms for you what we're doing up there. And, and what we're doing up there is really important, uh, not just for our own country, but for our own humankind. And I know I have taken way more of your time than I think I was allotted, but I have had so much um, pleasure in, in sharing this with you. And you've been such a great audience. I want to thank you. Uh, sincerely from my heart uh, for all the time and attention you gave me and, and sharing this with me. So thank you very much. Stay right here for a sec. I'm getting a Okay. I want to thank you for a wonderful evening, Dr. Caldwell. This was truly remarkable. And in the interest of time, I know we have a number of people in the audience that need to be at other places, I'm pretty sure. And so we'll dismiss you. But I think you're around for a little while if people have questions or oh, whatever. Sure. Yeah. And the other thing about NASA is they don't allow gifts over $25. So <laughs> I'm, you know uh, that. Okay. I'm delighted that you love pictures and photos because okay. this, I hope, will be one that you'll treasure as well in well, your okay. memory being here.